21. Verse 20. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Verse 21. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If you have faith and doubt not, you should not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if he shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. When he was come into the temple, the chief priests and elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority dost thou these things, and who gave thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I will ask you one thing, which, of ye, which if ye tell me, I in likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John. Whence was it? From heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did ye not then believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whether of them they... Whether of them twain or two did the will of his father. They say unto him, The first, Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. You may be seated. This parable of the two sons is quite an interesting parable. Uh, we have been emphasizing over this past year as we've studied the parables of Christ, and, and I have to apologize this morning. I said, I think it was last week, that we were going to finish them by the end of the year, but that was because I left out an entire section of parables in my calculations. So there's about five extras that I forgot about. So we're not going to finish the parables by the end of the year. We'll go into them in January, and then after that, we'll be done with the parables. We've been emphasizing the parables of Christ, and we've seen that a parable is a natural story with a spiritual intent. It's not prudent to seek allegory in the parables, especially seeking to find a corresponding meaning to each and every detail of the parable. We get into interpretation nightmares that way. We also have emphasized that a parable has one meaning. One meaning. Jesus meant one thing when he gave the parable. In other words, it's incorrect to say what this parable means to me is... By the way, it's incorrect to say that about any passage of Scripture. Because what it means to me, it needs to mean to everyone. There's one interpretation. That doesn't mean you can't apply it in different manners. But the Scripture means what it says. And we're trying to come to an understanding of what it says. So it's best not to try to trivialize the parables by saying, well, you have your opinion about what it means, I have mine. I know there are some difference in interpretation, but we're trying to find in the context the, the meaning that Jesus had in giving the parable. And the best way to do that, friends, is by looking at the background of what he was saying and when he was saying it. Just like any story someone might tell, it's good to know some background, right? It's good to know the context of which it's being spoken. And the intent of the parables, I think, is best understood by a thorough and correct understanding of the context as Jesus spoke it. And the events we read in Matthew 21 have a profound bearing on the correct interpretation of the two parables found in this chapter, one we're looking at today. The parable of the wedding of feast we looked at last week. So let's look at the background a little bit here in Matthew 21 and follow through as we go before we get to the parable. I think it'll make the parable make more sense concerning the two sons that we read. So here, back in uh, the beginning of chapter 21, we find Christ and his disciples traveling to Jerusalem for the final time in Christ's life. We've come to the end of Christ's life. The next time he will leave Jerusalem, he, he lives at, he's staying outside of the city limits, but leave the area of Jerusalem would be to ascend to his Father in heaven. 
This is the last time he comes to Jerusalem. And so they're getting ready for this last entrance, the beginning of what we have called the Passion Week of Christ. This is why we find the final parables, the one we looked at last week of the wedding feast that has such harsh language about the king going out and killing those who rejected his servants. Harsh language because Jesus is at the end of his ministry and he is saying, listen, repent or perish. He's not pulling any more punches. Listen, this is important. These last parables are very passionate, very direct, very penetrating to the heart of the ones listening. Specifically, he penetrates the leadership's heart. Specifically in these last parables, he speaks of the Jewish leaders who rejected him and bound heavy burdens on the people, leading them to reject him. And so usually we see in these parables surrounding this context, the bad guys in the parable represent the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. It's the villains of the stories. As Jesus prepares to enter Jerusalem, you remember this? He sends two of his disciples to find a donkey and a colt with the donkey. And he says, bring them. The master had needs them. And God had ordained those animals for this purpose. And therefore, uh, they, there was going to be no question as about someone releasing them to come. And this is exactly what happened. This is to fulfill a prophecy in Zechariah 9.9. The Bible talks of Christ, the Messiah, entering, riding, humble and lowly, riding upon the foal of an ass or the, the offspring of a donkey. So in find the beginning of Matthew 21, Jesus rides in on this colt into Jerusalem on the first day of the week. Multitudes gather together with palm branches and clothes laid out on the ground and they're crying out, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Testifying that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. There is no other. And the entire city is in an uproar here in the beginning of this with what is happening. But Jesus isn't done yet because he gets off that colt, strides up to the temple, and for the second time in his ministry, grabs the tables and throws them on the ground, opens the cages, and chases the money changers out of the temple. Once again, fulfilling the prophecy when Jesus says to them, it is written, my house. Did you catch that? My house, he calls the temple. You don't call the temple your house unless you're God. My house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And so the second time, he chases out of the temple. Jesus is pretty serious here at this Passion Week. He's coming to cleanse. Because in a little bit, he's going to go right to that temple and be crucified for our sins. And he wants to make it clear that he is the Messiah. It's his house. And therefore, he can destroy it. He can tear it down, be it his body or the regular temple. It's his. He is king. He's had the wedding feast. He has invited the people to come. These are the parables in this area. Respond to the king or perish. That's his last message. That's not politically correct, is it? He's serious. But that's not all he does as he then sits there. And you can imagine all the people in shock. This happened twice. This is the second time. They should have known it was coming. He sits there and all the lame and the poor and the blind, they come to him and he heals them and sends them away. He's not done doing miracles. He's healing all the people. His fame is growing even more. Obviously, from the fame of writing in with everybody calling Hosanna in the highest, Zechariah 9.9 was never used by the Jewish people except for referring to the Messiah. They understood it the entire time throughout the Old and New Testament. This is the Messiah. So when this happens, the leaders knew in their mind, there is no doubt this man and the people believe he's the Messiah. And then he chases out the money changers and calls it my house. And then he begins to heal everyone. <laughs> You see, what we have...